Welcome to U2 Spain Live. Can you believe it's been four years since Brexit? Almost four years. It's been almost three years since the end of the withdrawal agreement. And so much has changed for Brits wanting to move to Spain. In today's q and I'm going to be chatting with our very good friend, Chris from Upsticks, who's been helping people move for many years. And we'll be finding out exactly how mad and crazy it's been, how much it's changed and what new things are happening with Upsticks as they enter a new era with their own YouTube channel. So join us both on the virtual city by the virtual pool. Relax, have a chat. Give us a, give us a wave in the chat there. There'll be plenty of very helpful information and answers to all of you throughout the show. So stick around, enjoy the live chat, or if you're watching the video back afterwards, you can ask questions and chat in the comments below. First of all, though, gather round, give us a wave, hit the like button, have your questions ready, or just relax. You're all welcome to you 2 Spain. Here we go. You ready to dance? Let's do it. Oh, yeah. Forgot to do that. Let's dance. Groovy, baby. Right then, just before we get chatting, don't forget to make a note of our website, u2spain.com. It'll be on the screen all the way through. It's growing all the time and you can find loads of resources, specialists and links that you need for your move to Spain and for living here. All of the videos, um, if, if you want to find out what's on what video, there we've now got, don't know how many, 250 something videos, I think that are on the channel. Some of them are the, the live shows, the big long videos, and some of them are the, the midweek videos. We've got all of the subjects, I think, to cover everything about moving to Spain and living here as well. And there's a free newsletter at the beginning of every month that you can sign up for. And uh, it's already written and ready to go out for October the 1st, which is tomorrow. And so if you want to be subscribed to that, then do it soon. If you don't do it by uh, you know, uh, midday tomorrow, then you won't get October's newsletter. There you go. And that's free to do it. And it's also free to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Doesn't cost a penny. And that is a win, win, win with a cherry on top. Now, without further ado, let's meet our excellent guest for today. It's Chris from Upsticks. Hola, Chris. Hola. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Yes, very well, thanks. Yeah. Very good. It's been uh, exciting times, hasn't it? And it's been a, it's been a bit of an exciting week. We had this uh, this news item. We'll do the we'll do a, some news flashes in a minute to update everybody on that news item. And we've got uh, uh, Doogie Dogs here. He might be making an appearance. You never know. But first of all, let's talk. I, um, yeah, any shout outs? Any clients of yours? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got quite a few actually. It was just uh, funny enough. I've, uh, I've for my a couple of weeks ago, it's my birthday, and I bought myself a giant computer screen. So now, instead of having to write notes, I can have them on one side and look at you on the other, purely for the show. Oh, it's <laughs> so, so exciting. Notes now. But yeah, we've got, um, there's a lovely lady, uh, Mrs. Allen, who's got her visa, and she's coming over. I know they want channels, so well, that's great, and her husband will be following very shortly. Oh, yeah. that's, that's, Liz's, that's Liz's maiden name, I wonder if they're oh, in different it? relations. Yeah. I don't say first names, I don't know how I'm, I'm supposed to do that sort of GDPR uh, bases, but the yeah. Oars, the Sharps, the Peaks, uh, Mrs. Nelson, Mrs. Fraser, all got your visas, and they're all coming over here and on our list now to go to stage two, which is uh, absolutely fabulous. And mm -hmm. the Browns as well, who are actually coming in and having their appointment the day after they fly in. So that's going to be a record, uh, record visa registration as well. Brilliant. And who do we have on the live chat? We've got Robbo. Hello. Buenos tardes. Buenos dias, rather. It's not tardes yet. Uh, Del Boy. Morning, Scats. This time next year, we'll be moving airs. And Bev says good morning. And she's got McGroovy in a question mark there, which uh, you may be the only one on this channel who knows what that means. I have a, I have a group called Cool and Groovy, and also we do Celtic Nights. So, and on those Celtic nights, we're called Oh Cool and McGroovy. So, and I am, of course, the groovy one. So there you go. That's explaining that. And uh, good morning to Andy Cooper. And I've left uh, A.K. Mitchell, Ant and Kester last to say, to say hello. How's it going in uh, Morocco? 
are people going on holiday there. They run a, a tourist business to help people go to Morocco. And of course, after the after the earthquake there, there have been people not going, uh, afraid that they're going to get in the way of recovery efforts. But I saw uh, the guy that that Anton Kez actually um, gave to us to do a, a tour of Marrakesh, uh, put a message up on Facebook saying, please come, please come tourists. We need you to be there and um, to to bring the money back into the economy, you know. So that's a message from over there. And uh, there's Lionel Knights, uh, Glyn James, Glyn and Simone here from their new home in Almanthora, Almeria, just to say thanks to you both for your wonderful help and advice on making our move here this year. Wonderful. Bengal Bert is there. And um, John, John McClue, of course. Hello there. And Jason's web. Oh, he's saying he'll watch later. He's busy today. So that's who's on the, the, the live chat. So we did news this week our wednesday video i've got my news background going there and so let's have some news flashes shall we let's have one from you chris the the, the bls building in um in london they've taken over haven't they finally from the london consulate yeah so we've been having problems this happened actually yesterday yes yesterday afternoon um it's more about the booking uh, the appointment now so what's mm -hmm. happened is bls took over the actual managing of the appointments but the booking was done through the consulate so it was the same booking platform as we had before you have to send them a load of details and a copy of your acro well up till this monday i think it was we were still getting codes through for a calendar which now doesn't seem to work and now yesterday we got a, a notification um well one of our clients who actually sent in the request got a response back which said that the london consulate is no longer going to be managing the appointment booking system for the london appointments so it's going to go on to the bls platform which we've been looking at this morning there doesn't seem to be availability at the moment to book the appointment so we're gonna i've actually did a registration with them to see what the process was we know that they deal with the, just the temporary schengen visas as well and the platform only seems to accommodate those visas so we'll be mm -hmm. keeping an eye out over the weekend for all our clients who've got appointments pending in london and uh hopefully give you an update as soon as we know what the process is Excellent. Is that all three consulates now that have farmed out their appointments? At the moment, the status is uh, London seem to have completely farmed it out now with this appointment sort of news. Uh, Edinburgh, we're still applying for appointments um, through the consulate. It's going onto a Google Calendar platform, but they're being attended to at the BLS mm -hmm. office. And Manchester are still running their own appointments. We're still waiting to see what happens there. So. Um, what happens with Manchester is people are requesting their codes, um, which an important bit of information, if you are requesting your code, make sure that your PDF that you send to request it is less than two megs. Okay, mm -hmm. because they ask for a lot of documents, but then they don't give you much space in email. Um, and they're taking around a week to issue the codes and the appointments are running pretty fluidly after that. Um, but we'll keep you up to date. I mean, that's it's, it's changed quite a bit in the last six months how the appointments and offices <laughs> you have to go oh. to the books. Right. Second news item then. Uh, rejections have now been approved. Tell us all about that. Yeah, so if you remember at the beginning of the year, we had uh, that spate of one day, one Friday, uh, they rejected in Manchester a load of medical certificates which were issued legally, I have to say, in Spain. Uh, but the clients were not in Spain at the time that the medical certificate was issued, albeit that the Spanish law says that you can issue it. In fact, they encourage telemedicine. Mm -hmm. here. Um, so, I mean, I think we had we had seven rejections uh, all come through in one day, which was you know horrible for us and our clients, evidently. And across the board, it went all over the Facebook. It went absolutely mad. I mean, we were counting over a hundred. Um, but finally, finally, after an official complaint, believe it or not, on this one, we had five of them were approved just under appeal and just one just wouldn't, we just couldn't get it out. And it was exactly the same appeal and paperwork as the rest of them. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, I think we watched your channel as well, the lovely Downward family, and, I, and uh, eventually we had to go and move an official complaint and the visas were issued the next day. So uh, that's it now. All of them have been approved, so uh, yeah, it's been Brilliant. a long journey, but it uh, keeps our record. 
Yeah, you've got a hundred percent record on approvals for non lucrative visa. Back yep. to a hundred. Brilliant. Excellent. Let's follow up on yesterday's news flash then, those of you who've watched the video. If you've not watched the video, watch it. There's a very 59 second video. I had to keep it under a minute, which is why um, Doogie Dog didn't appear, uh, our news anchor. I just had to report it. Let's, uh, let's just have a hello from Doogie. Hello. There we go. He's here if you need him. And so the news flash was all about um, Olin or OliveNet, as they used to be known. They're based in Alarin El Grande. Is it? They're, they were back online at about four o'clock after a 12 hour outage. That's quite extraordinary. That's not many companies go offline for that long. It does beg the question, have they got the infrastructure to deal with their clients? And they certainly don't seem to have enough staff to deal with customer inquiries. There was a big line outside the, their shop yesterday, according to reports on Facebook, and nobody was answering the phone. So are they on the way out? That's the question. What do you reckon, Chris? Well, yeah, I say, I mean, I reached out to you and a couple of other people on, and Sam, who's been on the channel, I reached out to you guys who are on social media quite a bit because I have, we don't have it in the office, but I, because I live in a slightly rural area, um, these guys, they service the rural, area, rural areas, okay, mm. with, with, with fibre, and um, we got up to no internet um, yeah, in the morning, and... Um, and I couldn't really work out what it was. But then the most scary thing was, then we went online and all the web pages were down and all the phones had been turned off. So suddenly you start thinking the worst, don't you? You know, you start yeah. thinking, right, everything's completely gone out of business. Then we've got, normally, they've had glitches before where it's come back online pretty quickly. By nine o'clock, it hadn't come back online. Then I started sending messages to people I know who've got who in social media groups because I'm not that active on Facebook like yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And you immediately came back with a lot more information, which actually settled me and said you're not the only one. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, it's a big problem with um, things like people who are in the, out in the campo with security cameras and stuff, because mm -hmm. they all work with the internet. And then obviously, also, they run a lot of uh, businesses as well. So I think uh, there's an awful lot of backlash. And I, I think just maybe a simple statement on the website, albeit we are working on it would have been a lot better than just shutting comms down completely. Mm -hmm. I remember reading on the Facebook group, I think it was, or a Facebook page, they'd only just put up a message and, and people were saying, what, what on earth are you doing? It's been, it's been down since four o'clock in the morning. You must have somebody you can update and at least tell customers what's going on. And that just wasn't fair to people like you who've, um, whose business could deal with it. Uh, you know, uh, rely on it rather, but fortunately you've got a different supplier at the office. Yeah, yeah but I mean, even that, I mean, we have, with our business, for example, I get up early in the morning to book the appointments that we need. So a lot of the time, uh, the, when you need to get appointments in various, I mean, the appointment booking system for the government is either blocked during the day or they kick you out because you're only allowed to book three appointments. So we find it works really well, like between the five and seven watching in the morning so yeah. quite often i'll set the alarm and look at our appointment booking list and go right okay let's hit it this morning and so it mm -hmm. does affect you because for example on a friday is the only day that they open up for certain police stations at seven o'clock in the morning so mm -hmm. they didn't get booked they might. there you go so that's the update on that we'll uh, we'll keep you updated on that and on any other news really but big news for you your youtube channel what's going on with that Yes, we monetized our YouTube channel. Ooh. Can you believe it? After 130 videos, and uh, and um, I suddenly got a message from uh, YouTube saying, "Would you like to monetize your channel?" I was like, "Yeah, okay." Then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why not? <laughs> so, yeah. And you weren't you weren't really aiming for it at the start. You're just doing it as information, and you knew there weren't going to be they're kind of quite short videos, short information videos. So you knew it was going to take quite a while to to build up, and you weren't aiming to to earn money from it because it's a, it's a service to you to your clients isn't it but it's it's big news and you're going to start making other style videos as well from uh, with customers and uh, people around Spain yeah that's I mean that's the idea I mean when we when we initially started the channel believe it or not it was as we're talking about Brexit during the withdrawal agreement um, we because it all happened so quickly we got so many FAQs from clients which are exactly the same Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we did was I said, well, just to Jane, my colleague, I said, I'll make a video and just send them the link. 
because we can't answer every question, you know, because it can be a bit mm-hmm. crazy back there with the withdrawal agreement. And that's yeah. how it all started. And then obviously it's run into the non to visa stuff about the cars. Um, quite often when I'm driving about, I'll just stick the phone, record and talk nonsense, which some people really like. <laughs> like, like yeah. Since driving videos, there's some really great comments from them. Um, and, um, and yeah, and it's sort of gone from there. Um, it's something I really enjoy, to be honest. Um, yeah, I do like doing the videos, um, and so we're going to crack on with. Hopefully, we can start getting some clients on. Now we haven't got any clients on video. If anybody's willing to come on and just have a chat, we'd like to get more on about, you know, what's happening to people two or three years down the line. You know mm-hmm. what their experiences are. So we, we're so much on there about how to get here, but what actually happens when you're here, and, and the tips from people who may be not in the same position as ourselves. I've been here for many years. But recently here and their experience, that's what I'd love to get on. Brilliant. You could do it investigative journalist style and just turn up at their door, you know, <laughs> not gonna, with your camera on them. <laughs> I, I'd love that. I'd, I love the ones that were a bit like the passport office and the consulate and stuff like that. It was, uh, yeah, that was brilliant because um, you never really know. It's, it's not scripted. Well, none of it is, to be honest. And uh-huh. you never really know what's going to truly happen. Good fun. Right then, that's the end of the news. I should have done a, a newsroom theme. Da, 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 da. There we go. <coughs> that's enough of that. Let's get on to the topic. Oh, and uh, uh, hello from Janet Stanton. She's got a bad connection, appropriately, so she's going to catch up later. And John McClue says, "Yes, been watching your videos, Chris. Great advice. Yeah, there's there's loads of great ones up there. Right then." <clears throat> so we usually have a topic on this show that's very focused on on some aspect of visas or residency or cars or lots and lots of other topics. But today we're going to open up a discussion about the amazing changes, pretty mad changes over the past four years since Brexit and what it means to you as expats, in inverted commas, um, immigrants, um, and how both Chris and I have experienced it all too. So put your questions and comments in the live chat. Tell us what it all means to you personally. We'd love to hear from you, whether you're a regular guest or a newbie to the show. So the dreaded B word is going to be bandied about a lot, I'm sure. You can't really avoid mentioning Brexit when you're talking about it and moving to Spain uh, any time in the last seven years since that dreadful vote. But we're not going to just sit here and complain about it. Let's talk about what's changed and how we can help you understand it and navigate the sometimes tricky pathways to your new life in Spain. So then, Chris, what were you doing four years ago? <laughs> so four years ago, I mean, we were, um, obviously, when we came out of lockdown, it was a crazy time, because when we came out of lockdown, um, we went straight into the withdrawal agreement. So just before lockdown, uh, albeit that we knew the wheels were in motion um, for Brexit, Brits were still getting the green EU star residency card, mm-hmm. and because there hadn't been an agreement put in place. Uh, as soon as uh, Boris Johnson basically decided that he wasn't going to extend the withdrawal agreement, we got the notification that the Brits will no longer get the EU card, which mm. meant we had to start looking at the third country national platform and how the withdrawal agreement was going to was going to pan out. And uh, so that's what we were doing, literally making and updating videos and, and keeping our eye on the websites to find and going to the police station to find out what was actually happening. Yeah, and did they know? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose they used to a lot of uh, you know other people from around the world, from other third countries, getting their uh, residency there and bringing their visas over from their country, but not the the British ones. Were the were the were the rules any different for the Brits? getting their residency after Brexit? Yeah, there were. So, I mean, you had that six, we had a six months period just before the cutoff date where um, you, they, they, there was a two week period where we didn't know. And mm. there was a, the difference was, and it's, we always talk about having permission and not having permission to reside here. So the difference was that after the, uh, the, the non-extension to the withdrawal agreement past the 1st of January was announced, so they weren't going to extend it. Um, then Spain moved onto the platform where if you're a Brit, you have to now declare your residency within the withdrawal agreement, i.e. you now have to have permission. And that mm-hmm. happened before Brexit even came into play. So what happened, the Brits used to go to a police station, which is in Estrangeria, because they had the right green card, 
they suddenly they went, we're not issuing any more green cards. Now you've got to apply. And that was really the British, the Brits' first experience with going through immigration, because that's what mm. it was. So you have an online platform. They have very limited appointments in the office to go and do it, because it's a completely different office to where you register the TIA card. Mm. And they had to submit all the documents. This is people who have been here for, for years as well, not actually got their residency in place. Mm -hmm. uh, proof that they'd been here and you would get permission and then go and register for the TIE card. So around, I'd say, the beginning of August, uh, which would have been 2020, was when we saw the first TIE cards under the withdrawal agreement come out in Brits. Mm -hmm. And at that same time is when they started encouraging us to exchange our green cards for TIE cards as well. Mm -hmm. So you've got two groups of people here. You've got the ones, the Brits who are already here. Going through that withdrawal agreement and changing over to, to get their TIE card. Some of them, I mean, they didn't have to get a TIE card. They could, they they were still within the rules just to keep their their green card and be part of that. But they were kind of encouraged to, yeah. because it was going to be good for bureaucracy in the future, I suppose. But so that's one of the groups. But and then of course the new clients started coming in who were coming in from for the first time from the UK. Yeah, we had, I mean, during that period, we had a, there was a lot of movements, a lot of people trying to get in before the deadline. Places like Malaga really, really uh, were unreceptive to people who had just landed and wanted to apply um, mm -hmm. towards the back end. And places like Granada were absolutely fine as long as you registered on the Padron before um, you got, before you went to, before the 1st of January, sorry. So, um, and in fact, we had, it goes to show the disparity in, in, in the provinces because in Granada, we had a couple who we did the declaration so they could get their withdrawal agreement residency. They got it approved, but because they'd been on the Padron since 2018, they gave them their residency from that day. So we're mm. actually now three years, about four years after Brexit, We've done their permanent residency already. They've now got 10 year cards because their residency was predated. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, that was quite a, a comical situation. So it was, but yeah, during that time, there was an awful lot of turn and fro and misunderstanding from even different parts of um, parts of Spain uh, provinces about the rules of the withdrawal agreement. Mm -hmm. and there was that big confusion about letting. Um letting the DGT, the Traffico, know that you wanted to exchange your license as well before the deadline. Yeah. Um, some some lawyers were saying, uh, uh, no, no, you can't do that without your TIE card. And of course, the TIE cards were in a backlog, so nobody was getting them in time. So there was that panic. Yeah. And then right towards the end of that, they had that December, the pre-registration sort of amnesty type thing, didn't they? And that went a bit mad and lots of people yeah. caught up in that. Um, but I have to say, I mean, we always, one of my biggest bugbears is when people say, well, why is Spain making it so hard for us? Well, they didn't. In fact, during the withdrawal agreement, Spain bent over backwards. You know, yeah. we had special appointments and more staff put on, which were actually left in place all the way up to six or seven months after uh, Brexit for people to exchange their, their green cards. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, it was, um, it was, we I mean, they, if they didn't have to, to do it, I suppose, but I mean, there was a huge British population who hadn't registered their residencies in theory mm -hmm. in 90 days if they reside here, albeit you're in you, you should have done. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, it was a crazy time, but also a time that people, I believe the authorities reacted accordingly and um, we got the jobs done that we needed to get done. Yeah, well, I'm sure there's a great deal of difficulty in just telling everybody, getting the message across to all of the Brits in Spain that they needed to do something. They couldn't just sit there. They needed to tell Spain they wanted to stay. And there were, there were presumably quite a lot who were living under the radar, as they called it, and they hadn't really registered anyway. They were just hanging about in Spain and uh, taking advantage of this uh, freedom to travel and freedom to work, uh, which they thought meant that they didn't have to register after 90 days to say they were resident. They weren't even on the Padron and uh, they just didn't bother. They were just just had a, a home there and uh, stayed there and and uh, went on the beach a lot. So 
they, of course, were the ones who, because they weren't even listening before, they certainly weren't going to listen to the new set of rules. No, and we had people also um, coming to us and saying, well, we're just going to hang on to do it until the 1st of January and see what happens. I'm like, that's uh, it's really not a good idea. No, we are going to hang on because we think there could be a deal. And then the deal, there, there was Yeah, the newspapers had a lot to do with that. Mm, uh, yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, there you go. We shan't complain about them. Uh, well, we probably will, but uh, not right now. Um, John McLean said, will I have to go back to where I'm applying for my TIE card in Murcia or will they post it out to us? No, you have to go back, I'm afraid, John. You've got to go, go one appointment, give them your fingerprints um, and uh, meet us there. And then after around 40 days, you go back to pick up the card. Yeah, there you go. I've not been to Murcia. Is it nice over there? Yeah, I was there last year. Well, I'm doing It's Another thing we've got coming up is on November, I've got the... Uh, I've got the Upsticks road trip coming up. <laughs> so last year we went to a place in the sun, but this year um, I'm doing the Almeria, Granada, Almeria, Mercy, Alicante, Valencia road trip to go and see all the people who work with us, to go meet some clients. And we're going to get some more content from new police stations that we've got uh, agents going to. So, um, and, you know, I'm a bit of a fan of actually going through the experience myself. So it means a road trip. Yay. Brilliant. So if anybody watching wants to join up with Chris on the road trip, and you want to get on one of his videos, then get in touch. Yeah, let me know. I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be covering all provinces in six days. So it's going to be, going to be a good one. And, uh, and yeah, Mercy is great. I went, I went to, it's got the police station in Mercia is the biggest one I've ever seen. Over Almeria has a huge police station as well. They have immigration <coughs> all in the same room. You know, it's like massive, well, the physical appointments, I mean, they also have a back office. And Mercia have, like, you go in and the, the building, I mean, the, the intimidating isn't the word, it's like four floors, which I assume is all the admin, and then inside you've got this, like, it's bigger than a bus stop, it's massive. <laughs> you know, and then they're like, so they go, Sala Tres, and we're like, where the women else Sala Tres? You know, go down the end, and, you know, it was, uh, it was a great experience there in, in Mercia, but it's um, it's a beautiful part of the world. Cartagena, um, again, we've uh, got a lovely town hall that we've done many padrons in. It's a beautiful place. Mm, brilliant. Robo says, Murcia is the Garden of Spain. Oh. So it's like Kent. <laughs> lovely, but probably even richer. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, Barry from Unitex says, morning, chaps. And uh, Ant says, thanks, Gats, for that. Our clients, uh, this is over to Morocco, 75% still travelling, wanting to support the locals. That's good to hear. Well, uh, hopefully if any of the other ones are listening, then the other 25% get over there. There's still a lot going on, and Ant and Kes can help you. <clears throat> so what else has happened? Of course, the big, one of the big changes for you, you weren't just dealing with residency you were dealing with consulates in the UK to get people visas, weren't you? Well, I mean, this came um, when we started looking towards the fact that there wasn't going to be a deal. We had to look at what were going to be the, the possible alternatives. OK, bear yeah. in mind, we were still in a COVID period then as well, weren't we? So there was a lot of offices were still closed. Um, and that's when um, this thing called a non lucrative visa came to light. <laughs> Mm -hmm. we were looking at looking at the different options because before then um we hadn't really dealt with many third country nationals because you wouldn't apart from maybe the odd american who would come in already with a visa and ask him to do uh, tie registration we wouldn't have any sort of dealings with that kind of thing um so you know we started to research and say well what is going to happen or what's going to be the next way the biggest way that brits are going to come and live in spain and that's when the NLV came to light, and we started our research with that. Um, and that was a because you, apart from the fact you could evidently download the requirements and see it, what are the nuances going to be. The consuls don't answer emails. You know what is the criminal records check they're going to need? How's that have to be positioned? All of that had to be put in place. Mm -hmm. and then um, obviously once we realised it was the March time that the consulates opened, we started our first ones. Mm -hmm. And um, once we realised that. that um, it was going to be the NLV it was going to be huge and we're going to focus a lot of our efforts on that. We realised it's national. So before, because our residency clients were all in Malaga, they registered in Malaga, we had to have somebody buy them in Malaga. And then we suddenly realised, 
oh, hang on a minute, we're going to have clients in Mercia, Alicante, Valencia, Canaries, mm-hmm. and they're all going to need someone at the appointment as well. <laughs> so that's when we started to expand the network and obviously you have to put in place a lot more professional, so we didn't have translators in the UK, stuff like that. So expanding the network during uh, 2021 was a huge, crazy time, I can say. Yeah, crazy for you and for the consulates, because of course, the course their staff had never dealt with visas before, unless they shipped in some of their their consulate staff from other countries who were experienced, you know, other third countries. I don't know what they did, but certainly they would have had to train everybody in the consulates that were facing people on the desks, all of their officials who were sorting out visas. Yeah. It must have been a mad time for them. Yeah, it was. And I mean, we had some like sort of crazy things. You remember if we, with the S1, the S1 went through a real <laughs> turbulent time, didn't it? You look at the yeah. videos I've got on, on, on the channel, but it was they, would, they wouldn't accept an S1, but it was a, still a legal agreement in place. Mm-hmm. Then they decided they would. Then they said, no, you needed to have health care, and most people wouldn't get health care. Then they decided they needed <laughs> to be registered. And mm-hmm. even now, even now, we had a couple of months ago, Somebody went in with a pre-registration of the S1 and they didn't accept it. They sent them a requirement letter for health care. <coughs> we then sent them a registered uh, a courier. We sent a courier package so they have to open it, addressed to a specific person. And they got back to them and said, oh, I'm very sorry, it was a mistake on behind the desk. What you sent us is perfectly legal. So mm-hmm. there's questions now going on about it. But yeah, that was just one of the things which was crazy. Yeah, I wonder how it's affected insurance company staff as well because they've got to have policies in English, maybe that they didn't have before, in English and Spanish. They're supposed to be in Spanish for the Spanish authorities, but <clears throat> did they have to set out a whole new set of rules, translated it into English for the for the new English market? Well, yeah, again, with the private insurance, and, I mean, people who are coming now on the NLV will get a product which is suitable for the NLV and paperwork which... Um, everybody at the concerts are used to seeing and they generally fly through, it's not a problem. But back mm-hmm. then, uh, the policies were, <laughs> were, weren't, they had residency policies, but they weren't apt for a visa because they required 12 months on the policy. Most, the standard way that a uh, insurance policy work here is you pay till the end of the year and you renew from January to January basis. Mm-hmm. So what we've seen now with the renewals is that the initial, there are some companies who really reacted and updated their products quickly, updated their certificates quickly, and took a whole chunk of the market. Mm. Um, and others that didn't, some of the big players didn't react that quickly, <coughs> and evidently they've been pushed them back. Um, and now what we're seeing is with the renewals, these companies are now pushing, pushing people, are putting people onto the January to January renewal after they had that first year, which might have taken them to September, for example. Mm-hmm. Okay, then they're going to pay up to the end and they go into the usual structure. And this has been accepted um, at the moment for renewal, which is good. Excellent. Um, it's good to see. Yeah, it's North- a time where at the, the, the one point the consulate was saying it had to be in, especially in Manchester, was saying it had to be in place at the time of the appointment. And then it was, no, we need it from a year from the time that you expect to enter Spain. Mm-hmm. It was, so it was, a, it was a crazy time. Yeah, absolutely. And the things are continuing to change, aren't they? I mean, we were talking about BLS, the centres that they're being, the visa appointments are now being farmed out to. And of course, that changes again in the consulates. They they no longer have to deal with that. So they're, they've they've moved their structure and BLS, uh, BLS are quite experienced, aren't they? They've been doing it for years for other countries. Yeah, I mean, more short-term visas for on, on the chain, but, you know, they, they have been doing it. But again, as you say, you know, we had a client the other day in the BLS in London, and they wanted a copy of their driving licence as proof of their address. Well, we've always been happy with, as long as the bank the bank statements and the ACRO certificate all match up and it's the same address, that's always been sufficient. So now, you know, they came back and said, well, you, you didn't tell me to take a copy of my driving licence. So I was like, well, they've never asked one before. <laughs> so yeah. it's another thing you've got to add to the requirements through that experience. You know? So uh, it changes mm-hmm. constantly. I mean, there was a there was a period in BLS where they were asking for the official, their official downloaded uh, checklist to be signed as well. Now they're not asking for it, apparently. Um, and uh, 
passport retention, that just changes constantly. So <coughs> told everybody that BLS let you keep your passport. And then the other day in Edinburgh, they did let someone keep the passport. So it was like, uh, you know, it does officially say you cannot. And they told me in person, you cannot, only if it's for one day to go and do something. And then, you know, so you can never, never advise people they, they can retain their passports. But we know somebody who managed to, so it's... Uh, so how do you keep up with all of the, the changes? Have you got continuously changing Excel documents or something that you're changing? Or have you got things on the wall that tell you? <laughs> and of course, you've got to have different different regions as well who do things slightly differently. Do you just keep it all in your head? No, so we have, luckily, we have uh, <coughs> one of the biggest Google Drive folders you've ever seen. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, and uh, we keep, uh, that's all separated into different regions. And every time we have an update or something, we change we change the information in those folders, which then gets sent out to to the clients. So um, a lot of the times when you get a change, it's just getting on the phone to people, going about this is what they're going to ask you for, depending on on how they how far they are down the timeline. And then obviously, um, when you come to do your stage two, which is once you've got your visa, you're registering it here. That's different in the provinces as well. So like Valencia require that there's certain things put on the EX17 that's not here in Malaga, for example. Mm -hmm. So all of that, um, all that goes into our individual processes, and uh, yeah, we have to manage it that way and update it constantly. And the staff in the extranjeros must have uh, uh, dealing with the well, we were talking about it earlier, weren't it? Dealing with the withdrawal agreement to start with, and then the British non-EU residency applications. Um, it must have really hit them especially in those areas with a high concentration of expats british expats yeah it did i mean we had the, the the fingerprint appointments as we call them which they had specific ones for brexit and then but there is there was specific appointments of people coming on visas and i can always remember going to my first non-lucid visa appointment here in malaga and the lady was going no 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 you've booked the wrong appointment Booked, you need a Brexit one. It's a British person. No, no, that's, this is a British person with a visa. It's the correct appointment. And she's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> here we go. Here we go. And, and then obviously that was the first one. And from now it's just boom, 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 boom now. But I, I can always remember that. I was trying to explain, no, this is, and even they weren't quite prepared for the amount of NLV they were going to see for people coming in uh, from the UK. Mm. I'll bet in some of the, the smaller smaller centres it was it was more like that but if they were wonder how quick they were to change in different regions yeah yeah no, that, but i mean here they have um accommodated here in malaga they've got a, there's a whole new room where they just accommodate anybody who's a third country national needs to register their fingerprint everybody goes into this new room and it's just a fingerprinting room it's yeah. huge you know it's absolutely massive and it's where, where it's where same room where spanish go and do theirs as well because they have to every 10 years update their DNA and um, they've just got it worked a lot clockwork to be honest now it was a little bit chunky chunk before where uh, foreigners have got one end but now it's in there 15 minutes an hour mm. it's like a factory <laughs> well oh Jed Tierney so Brexit prompted me to get my Irish passport yeah me too He's saying, I wonder how many UK citizens have applied for EU friendly passports. Well, apparently, if you research the Internet, there are 1.7 million Brits who should be able to get an Irish passport still. So there, there has been quite a lot. I mean, that's that's a that's another thing that's changed. The uh, the, the staff at things like um, uh, what's it called? The Foreign Births Register in Ireland, which is if you have Irish grandparents, that's what you've got to register onto. There was a huge, huge uh, backlog of applications <clears throat> on the Foreign Births Register and also in the passport office. And it all happened in 2020 when it was the lockdown. So they didn't have many staff in their offices at all. And the passport office, I think, uh, closed down completely for a little bit and it was all being done online. Because you have to do some of it, some of it's paperwork. And you can't do that unless you're in the office. It's, um, so that was mad for Ireland as well. 
and uh, not to mention all of the the, the situation with the, the border control between uh, the north and the south of Ireland or the or the sea in between Ireland and the UK however it's worked out and that's still not been resolved so all of the people that are involved in that uh, have gone through mad times I'd say and I was I was kind of partly in the middle of it all but uh, I we were going to apply for our Irish passports anyway before Brexit and it just happened to be the right time to do it then and we got stuck in the middle of it all the backlog happened while the lock the lockdown happened while mine was being processed so you couldn't get in touch with anybody and of course the Irish authorities don't give you any updates uh, you know people say when they're trying to get their visas you know I, I'm trying to get in touch with Manchester and see how my visa is going well if you wanted to try and get an Irish passport through naturalization and you try and contact them they're open for about two hours on a Tuesday and all the response they'll give you is it's in the process and we can't tell you anything and you say well how long does it take well there is no answer to that question because every single application is different and there are so many different processes that it has to go through and they're relying on uh, departments in the UK for example because I'm a, uh, I was a UK citizen they're relying on different police departments in the UK to do the criminal checks and they can't rush them along they've just got to send things off and wait for them to come back so and they don't know how long that's going to take so that's all the response that you would have got from there there you go that's Ireland for you just one more cog in the wheel it's, um, it's been a big cog isn't it the Irish passports <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So many people are going. Uh, Barry says, my wife is one of the 1.7 million. She's born in Northern Ireland and still qualifies. Yeah, that was a, a shock to some people because, they're, they're, of course, on Facebook, people are saying, no, no, you've, you've got to be proper Irish. You've got to be born in the Republic. And, but no, actually, it's, I'd read the rules there and you can be born on the island of Ireland um, anyway. So, uh, yeah, a lot of people from Northern Ireland to have British passports. Uh, suddenly realised, oh, I could apply for an Irish one as well. So, <laughs> John McLeese says, fiddlesticks. <laughs> I'm not sure what uh, <laughs> what you're saying it to, because it's probably something we said uh, 20 seconds ago, because there's a time delay. Well, he's because he's yeah. got to go back to pick up his card. Oh, I see. Yeah, he's replying to that uh, much earlier comment. There we go. So, it'll be a nice trip out, John. It'll be fine. Yes. Yeah. Unless, yeah, in an industrial area, it's great. Yeah, <laughs> nice road trip. <laughs> so, border control is another place where it's uh, where there's been a lot of change. Border control in the UK, and of course, it's not just in the UK where the situation has changed. But at every single Schengen border, land, sea, and air. So that's every airport in Schengen, every uh, sea border, which is quite a quite a long border that one, and. Um, uh, you know, so any ferries going over there, they've had to get used to um, stamping passports or not stamping passports, the, uh, checking the whether people have got a TIE card or whether they've still got their, their old residency card uh, and trying to work out because border control, uh, there was there was a period of time, wasn't there? I don't know how long it lasted for, but probably still lasting when some people at passport control uh, are saying no you don't need your passport stamped or yes I must stamp your passport and people get worried about that I was just reading about uh, somebody saying oh, I'm really worried I'm, I'm going for this time and and um, uh, I got a uh, stamp but I, I, I didn't get a stamp going back to the UK so will they still think I'm in in the Schengen area when I come back in again and they'll think I've overstayed and they were assured by people that it's a digital system as well they scan your passport it goes through a machine, they, scan, they know you've left, so all they've got to do is check. But it's, it's uh, handy if you keep all of your travel documents with you just to prove it. Yeah, yeah, no. So, <clears throat> crazy time, we had a, 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 a period of people coming in off the, off the ferry with visas and stamped down there and couldn't get a stamp. <laughs> and loads of people said, you're not getting a stamp. They're like, no. I'm like, why? <laughs> you know, so it's fine. You can do, you can, there's... If you have a stamp discrepancy, whether it be for first time registration or renewal, it can be dealt with, but it's a lot easier if you've just got the correct stamps in your passport. You know, yeah. to, um, 
in theory, it was explained to me um, that by someone at the airport actually that the the act of checking you into a flight, which the uh, we're talking about flying now, uh, which the um, the uh, companies have to do, basically it informs Interpol of your travel anyway. And then if you don't turn up, they have to they have to they have to, um, they have to uh, inform them. And we have had it before, where um, especially with uh, NIEs. So sometimes we do quite a bit of them. We do quite a few NIEs using uh, power turning for that. Okay. And so I'll go to the police station, stack them up, go, and when they're going through them, they check the stamps to make sure people haven't overstayed. But quite often, people have come to Spain, given us power turning, the appointment's in a month's time, and we haven't got the exit stamp. The people have already left. Um, and I'm sat there with a copy of the passport a month later saying, look, they came last month, but it took us this long to get the appointment. And now check online and see if there's left the country or not, and if the national police have access to their from theaters. We get their from theaters. So even mm-hmm. the national police and the Estran Heria have access to from theaters, and they should be able to see if there's left or not. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Bev says a lot of confusion with people traveling as so a non-eu person traveling with with or a, a traveling wig that's good she's corrected that to with <laughs> but i'm just imagining a traveling wig anyway traveling with an eu person so eu non-eu which queue do they go in and uh, stamp or no stamp so yeah there's lots of people uh, are still asking that one uh, but i think the the answer is normally a uh, non-eu person traveling with an eu person can go through the eu queue but it does depend. It depends on the person you get on the desk. And um, to some people, you know, the non-EU person has been turned back, so you've got to join the other queue. Join the UK queue, which is sometimes a lot longer. I remember when we go and pick up uh, our son Oscar from the airport at Malaga, there are usually, if he travels uh, from Dublin, because he lives in Ireland at the moment, or if he travels from Manchester, if he's visiting somebody over there, there's a there's a Dublin flight, a Manchester flight, and uh, a couple of London airports flights. They all arrive at the same time, and they're all Ryanair, and they're all. Uh, it takes about 15 minutes to walk from the Ryanair parking place all the way back down to the to passport control, and then there's just a massive queue of people with with only UK passports, and uh, so there are a lot of people who would love to have the the EU passport just to get through the the little queue. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Yes. On the way out, I, you know, on the way out from Malaga, I don't know if it works from anywhere else, please tell us if it does. Mm-hmm. I, because I've got a TIE card up and everybody in the British, I just go straight down the EU and I've never been stopped. Yeah. Give it a go. I suppose. Uh, yeah, I suppose if you go, yeah. I'll so you, 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 can only be, you can only be stopped if, if they feel like it, you know. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Barry from Unitech says, I think the most discussed thing is the 9180 rule on many of the expat sites. Everyone has a different answer for how to calculate it. I've got a video. Tell everybody, Barry, if you ever see it happen on an expat site, I've got a video reviewing. I went through the process of uh, an awful long process because I had to work them all out by hand and by, by, you know, in my head and count the days backwards, which is a right pain trying to count the days backwards on a calendar. And um, I worked out that there was only two of them on the, you know, if you Google search uh, Schengen calculators uh, out of the ones that came up on the screen, there were only two that actually work properly and tell you decent information, tell you up to date information. So have a look at that. And my favorite was visa-calculator.com. That is a very good one. And you can even kind of sign up to it. It keeps a record of everything as well. Of, of of where you've been so that you don't have to keep putting in all of the details every time which you have to with some of them some of them are just terrible and really badly laid out yeah so if you see that then push that one because they're, and they're very good people there as well they keep updating it just to make sure it's all it all looks good and they take on people's comments and suggestions so there we go that is that i've done loads of videos and one of the most in fact you're right one of the most watched videos i think eighteen thousand views now is my video all about what is the 9180 rule that i made two years ago and still being watched now 
So before we continue, I think let's let's go to the mid show adverts. You need to find out what things that are available from you to Spain. So <clears throat> let's hear from all of my alter egos. Here they come. See you in a couple of minutes. Are you getting something helpful from this show? Are you enjoying U2 Spain? Then click on the thumbs up and subscribe to U2 Spain while you're here. Ooh. And click on the bell for notifications. It's all free, but it's worth loads of money. I need coffee to keep my picker up. You can donate coffee to us all. There's a link in the video description below or use the QR code. It'll be in the top left hand corner of the screen after this message, sweetie. But that's not all. You can support U2 Spain with a regular monthly amount. It's only a few quid. Oh, he's worth a lot more than that. There's a link below to Patreon, where you can find out what extra groovy things you get by helping out. Oh, I'm all a quiver. One more thing. Get on with it. There's an important guest twiddling their thumbs. All right, calm down. The lovely video watcher needs this. Go on, then. There are lots of other links to vital things below. Like what? Well... Do you need private health care insurance? Yes. Do you need a visa or residency? Do you need to exchange currency? What about finding a property? Or getting tax and pensions advice? Or getting a Spanish mortgage? Or getting documents translated and apostilled? Or getting a medical certificate? Or finding a lovely little app for learning Spanish? Do you need the best mobile phone provider? Or a digital business card so you never need paper ones again? Or do you just want one of you two Spanish? t-shirts with a slogan on it. You can even get discounts on dental treatments and get a lovely little smile like scats. All of those links are there down below. If you can't find them, ask me in the comments. Is that everything, darling? I need to get my nails done. Probably not. But let's get back to the show, shall we? Back to scats in the studio. Oh, I wanted to say that. Oh, stop being beastly, you two. You too, Spain. Over to you, scats. <laughs> Thank you very much, Scats, and to um, Walter, Tommy, and Dick for joining us. I love that. I, uh, the, the line that keeps coming through to me when I'm, because I've got my headphones in, even if I'm wandering around, I can still hear what's going on, and it's Tommy going, What a medical certificate! I really enjoyed saying that. Yeah. So, anyway, if you've got any questions, anybody for, for any of them, or for the Colonel as well, I'm going to, I must make. Uh, a new little mid-show advert with the with the colonel in it. I think it's about time that everybody met him properly. So let's go. And it's all right, everybody. Chris wasn't twiddling his thumbs. He was. Uh, I would have got another cup of coffee. It's just it's just the right length of time to get uh, coffee. That's <laughs> it is. Yes, usually I, I just pop out. I've got to pop down the stairs. I've got some wooden stairs, and there's a there's a step at the bottom where which is just a piece of the old stairs that was that was going rotten. So I have to be really careful when I put my foot right through it at the bottom. So it's quite a funny operation. If you were watching from the outside, me sort of tripping daintily down the stairs. There we go. And uh, right, let's see if anybody's been talking while we've been while we've been there. We've got one. Facebook question so uh, let's deal with that first and then we'll go back onto the live chat and back to where we were so uh, let's get it up on the screen it was from Colin Underwood and it is all about registering your car so he is saying is it worth bringing your right hand drive car with you so many mixed views on this yeah because it depends on everything he has an Alfa Romeo 2 litre diesel Veloce or Veloce, if it's Italian, on a 6.0 plate, which is 2006. Worth practically nothing in the UK. Yeah, because they're always breaking down. Um, if I sell and the equivalent, oh, that's terrible. Alfa, that's a, that's a, a bad word for Alfa Romeo. I actually love them. They're lovely looking cars and uh, great when they work. And the equivalent in Spain is very expensive. Uh, advice, please. Is it more difficult post-Brexit? And how much would it cost to convert to Spanish plates? So, yeah, is, let's answer the, that last question first. Is it more difficult post-Brexit? Post yeah, if the cars come from the UK, it is because you have to go through the customs process. And that either means paying VAT or duty or waiving it if you are coming to take residence in Spain. 
Okay, so that's that's the first part, which is more expensive because whatever happens, even if you're waiving the tax, you have to pay an import agent to, to complete the operation anyway. Um, so, uh, well, you could do it yourself down in, in, in the port, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise to do that. I'd always get somebody to do it for you. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, after that, once you've got that process complete, it's the same as it was before. So, you have to go through the uh, technical requirements and then pay the relevant taxes as well as verification, which would be emissions tax, uh, local tax, and then obviously the, uh, um, the DGT, you have to pay their registration as fee as well. Um, would, would it be worth bringing Alfa Romeo in? It may be. I mean, we can give you a quote now about seeing the documents, but certainly Colin, drop us an email, we'll give you a quote and let you know how it's going to cost, how much it'll cost, and let us know how and when you get in residency as well, because that's a big, big decider on whether people bring their cars or not, because you have to have owned it for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. And if you are doing it, on, if you're an EU passport holder, for example, the time scale is completely different than if you're a non-EU passport holder. Mm -hmm. Sounds like he's owned it for a while, but that's only a guess. Sounds like one of those cars that people keep because they, they uh, just love it. And that would be the that would be the best reason for bringing it across, depending on the the expense. Depends on how much you've you've altered it as well, doesn't it? I mean, you've got to look at things like this. I mean, crazy a, a, an experience that we've had. So we registered many cars for clients, but one experience here in the office because we've bought a car over for up six drive, and um, it's a very very cheap cheap car. It was uh, it was given to us by a member family actually. Uh, to register, and we're going to pay the full tax, everything, etc., um, to get it in. It's still worth it because they're like two grand in the UK, and they're worth about six, seven grand here. But mm -hmm. then it's, I'll tell you, it's a Toyota IQ, one of the small ones, that are only made for five years. Mm -hmm. Great for like a little bit of advertising and put a logo on the side. But try and find the headlights. Yeah. It's been a month, so I went to Toyota. Toyota wanted wanted a grand. For the <laughs> 2009 car they said yeah and then and we can have them in a month then trying to find them second hand was an absolute nightmare until eventually out of nowhere one of these uh online uh sort of i put out a, a, a request actually request on there this guy came back to me and went i've got the full set for 300 euros and you can have them tomorrow and you're always you know it's second hand so it's always a bit of a risk and uh I paid him and lucky they turned up but you know mm -hmm. sometimes it's, it's checking whether you can actually get the left-hand drive headlights and how much they're going to cost as well that can inflate it sometimes hmm there you go colin hope that's answered your question get in touch with chris that's uh, that's another thing that's changed for you isn't it your upsticks cars yes so we're Upstix drive sorry yeah, yeah we've separated mm -hmm. now upsticks from what happened was so a bit of very pre-brexit history was um, I've been helping people register cars in Spain since 2006, so I've seen a, an awful lot of changes on that front. And um, way back when, they were quite a passion of mine. You know, that was probably most of uh, most of our business. But when Upsticks became a brand um, four years ago, uh, we were doing the residency and car registration. But obviously, with the onset of, of Brexit, what we're talking about today, and now the visas, which. Uh, I'm very passionate about um, the cars got left to one side unfortunately um and um so eventually it was always our, 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 our dream to have that as a separate department and to be handled by somebody so that's lara my wife is now fully handling up sticks drive it's their same brand the website will be live um earlier than 2024 probably but the latest will be 2024 and uh, that's completely separate now Mm -hmm. We'll do a special program with with Lara. You can you can go on holiday and uh, let Lara take over one day. Oh yeah, yeah. She's and she's and it's great. The good thing about it is because a lot of our cars, <clears throat> we we do get the odd person who comes in and says, "Here's a car. Would you like to register it for us?" But most of, I'd say most of our cars come from clients who are interested in in bringing them over with their visas. So it's great because then we have time to prepare the paperwork and we, I mean. As a lot of our clients know on, on the channel, I think on the chat that day, we often start engaging with them 18 months, 12 months before we do anything. The process mm -hmm. can take like eight or nine months. So um, having that separate but in the same group, it really works. Brilliant. Yes. Good. So uh, we'll have Lara back on the 
on the channel. I had a, it was, uh, it's nearly two years, I think, since, yeah. since Lara came on. She was talking about schools because she's in the position of knowing about Spanish schools and international schools because she works in one and your kids are in the other. Yeah, well, she, now she works here, but she did. She worked three years in the, uh, obviously our kids are in a public school and uh, she worked three years in the private school. And, um, and yeah, she's, uh, she's always had it. She's always worked with, like teaching with, with, with kids, you know, she's always done a lot on that front. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so eventually uh, we decided this year, um, we got a three year extension on, on the office here. So mm-hmm. it's in our office block, we're here till 2026 now. And it was like, right now it's time to uh, to launch the drive project. And, uh, I have to say, she's very happy. It's um, just like on, on, a, on a sort of personal note, she, she worked with younger kids and we had younger kids. All yeah. time. So all day long, it was just with young kids. Mm. You know, and I was like, I'm ready to work with adults again now. You know, our kids, our kids have got older. You know, they're like they're, they're seven and, and nine. Mm. And the school job was absolutely amazing but i think once your kids get a bit older the last thing you want to do is go to work then we'll have a three-year-old so yeah, the tiny ones yes yes yeah, i know. was i was going to ask the question i'll ask you this question anyway which, uh, i'm sure she'll enjoy has, <laughs> has working with three-year-olds helped you in this in this new job <laughs> <laughs> but with tan- yes first of all tantrum for me in the office now that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant uh, right. Yeah, no, so, so yeah, so she's really she's really embraced it. As you she's working with adults, she's got to have conversation with some people now. Okay? <laughs> Brilliant. Right. Let's get back on the live chat because there have been lots of comments. Uh, John McClue says, "Hit the like button, folks, and support this great channel." Absolutely. Yes. If you've not hit the like button already, do that. And um, and uh, uh, Anthony said earlier, and. Uh, looking forward to coming over next year and uh, joining up with the two of us again. That was that was lovely to say. And Glenn says, my sister was due to come and visit this week from the UK. Even after us telling her of all of the changes after Brexit, she fell foul of the date of issue on her passport. She was refused boarding. Yeah, there was that thing of some passports were, there was a, more than 10 years from the date of the issue of the passport to the expiry of the passport. And those, the extra bit on the end of the 10 years was kind of wiped out after Brexit because that was an EU thing that was allowed. So you had to work out the expiry date from the issue date. You had to work out 10 years. And then there's this three months gap that you had to leave. And then of course, some airlines were saying it needs to be six months because you've got to You've got to imagine that if your trip is for three months, which is what you've got on your passport in in the Schengen area, it's still got to be three months before the deadline date, before the expiry date. So there was this big mix up with that. So, yeah, so people still don't know what what date is supposed to be on their uh, on their passport. Yeah, and obviously that affected some people who were applying for visas as well because the expiry date wasn't the real one. Mm. So. Madness, all part of madness. And Ant says, Brexit prompted my Irish uh, port, passport, I presume that means. Um, uh, having an Irish mum gave instant qualification, accepted, issued in just weeks. Good luck, anyone doing the same. Now, of course, that's the easiest one to get is if it's just one of your parents that was born on the island of Ireland. And um, yeah, because you just have to apply through the passport office with the correct documents and proofs of your lineage. So that is good. Yeah, so good luck to everybody doing that. And um, bum, 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 bum. Jed Tierney says, my mother was Irish, applied online, sent in the relevant certificates and it took six weeks to receive the passport, cost about 90 pounds. Very good, yeah. They've got the system going really, really well now. And even during the lockdown, it was taking two years to go through the, if it was a grandparent, through the foreign births register. But now some people are saying it's down to seven or eight months. So it's a lot quicker now. Um, I, it's, I don't think it's a lot quicker if you're going through the naturalisation route, which is what I went through. Um, and you have to live in, in Ireland for a period and it's, and you have to prove that you've been there for almost every single day of that. <laughs> and um, so, 
that takes longer, that can take up to two years. I think from the point when you start the application to the point when you actually get your physical passport, uh, it took us 20 oh, something months, I think, back then. I don't think that's going to get much quicker. What about if you have Irish grandparents? Uh, that's um oh that was it was taking two years but that's that's the one that's can be seven or eight months now okay. so that is good to know it's worth planning ahead that's timing is everything and you've got to plan ahead and and cares in the eu we travel as irish and in the uk as brit so far sailed through no issues i still have my uk passport but i haven't used it i think since i i feel like it's uh somehow wrong to use my UK one when I've got an EU Irish one even if I'm going into the UK I'll go no I'm Irish now and it doesn't I mean fortunately the UK they quite like Irish passports and there's an agreement that predates the Schengen area anyway so they don't tend to question Irish ones I've got, there we go. I've got my UK one but I got in trouble I'm in trouble now because it's still three years left in it but it's completely in that league Hey, oh, is it a mess? <laughs> we used to do everything, didn't we? Go to, go to get the NIE numbers. I have to have the passport, notary's passport, travelling passport. And they said to me, I've got to get it both at the airport and at the police station. The other day they said, I know it's still 2026, but you're going to have to get that sorted out. <laughs> so mm -hmm. they don't, if, if you have to use them regularly, they don't last very long, I tell you. No. It's not cheap, though, is it? No. How much is it? for? It's, it's more expensive in the UK than it is in Ireland, I think. Yeah, I think it's about 100, 100 euros. I think the last time so we had to do all, all of us did, had to do it, one. I think we didn't, we couldn't come short when I registered my daughter and got the renewal for my son and Lara. I think it was like 400 euros in a year or something. Whoa. I've got to, I've got to research. I don't know if you can renew early, can't you? You can renew your passport early and get a new one. I've still got three years. Yeah, now. yes, you can. Uh, and I don't know what the, the what the renewal period is. I, I presume you can renew whenever you want. Right, so if it's deteriorated, then you can just renew. But I don't want to get a three-year yeah. passport. No. Oh, so maybe it's within three or six months or something like that. It's yeah. worth checking. It's worth checking on that. You can do it online. I'll have to, I'll have to check online, so I do need to get a new one now. Yeah. Good. Be prepared, you see. If Chris needs to be prepared by 2026, then do it now. <laughs> yeah, well, if it were less than the photo page of my passport drops off. first. <laughs> yeah, that would be important. And Glynn says, unfortunately, people in the UK and people we have met here in Spain still do not inform themselves. No, it is, uh, it is difficult because you, know, you, you go through your everyday life and you don't tend to think about these things. And Brexit was a, a very good example of that. There's so many people, when people get it wrong and they're not informed, that, you know, people jump on them and say, you should have known about this. The, the, the referendum was in 2016, for goodness sake. You haven't, you haven't you been watching? But of course, the news was all about, oh, it's all right, we'll get a deal, we'll get we'll get a proper deal and everything, nothing's going to change. And that's what the politicians were saying. So that's what the, and the newspapers were making it sound uh, really, really easy because they were all on the side of Brexit. And because uh, they said, and we're all British, so we can get things done and nothing will be different at all. So it'll be our rules. But of course, it's not. Once you get on the Schengen border, it's not. It's not British rules anymore. You've not won anything, really. <laughs> so, there you go. We should have a competition, you know. I wasn't going to mention this at the start of the show because it would mean that people would be counting as they go through the show, but should we have a competition in which the question is, how many times have we said the word Brexit on this show? Ah, there you go. We've got some prizes. Anyone's folders? There we go. There prizes. Go. So Folders to give out. Send us your address. Yeah, so it means you've got to watch the whole video all over again. <laughs> well, yes, it's good, though. I have to do it at the end of the show and, and sit down and watch the whole thing just so I can put up the time codes to help you all out so that you can skip backwards and forwards. But I'm not going to give time codes for all the mentions of the word Brexit. Brexit, Brexit, Brexit. There you go. There's another three. So, Jed says, can't understand why the view count on both of your sites is not higher. They are without doubt the most helpful and accurate channels dealing with relocating to Spain on YouTube. Thank you so much. I think the reason it's not higher is because there's only a certain number of people moving at one time and a lot of people only use one particular 
uh, channel or route to get their information. Some people use Google, some people use the expat sites. And although I share to all of the expat sites that I can find that deal with Spain, they some people just don't look at their notifications, they don't look at Facebook very often. And there aren't that many places where I can get these videos seen and the links to the videos seen. It's best if you can share them. So everybody that's online at the moment, share the videos. The more shares, then the, then the, the higher up the list of videos that you can watch after this video, it, it'll appear further up the list. So do that and you'll help us out. Thanks for that. To prove income, Alicante Explorer says, as prove income for the NLV, do I just need my last year's tax return or monthly statements too? If so, what period of statements? Good question. So, so if you're using bank statements of a passive income going into the bank, you, depending on what the source is uh, there, you would need six month statements. What we always say is that, again, I don't know the source of the, uh, the income, but say, just give you an example, say it's a pension that is being paid out which you have a P60 for, the P60 is also going to show what the annual amount for that pension is, and um, you'll have six months statement showing the pension being paid. Okay, so it's always a good idea. Um, what we say is to have your, should we say, the, the, the statements on top. You know, if you've got any cash assets, certainly put that on top of your statements, then, you, then your passive income and proof of what the annual income actually is if you've got it. The reason is we need to make it as easy as possible for the agent behind the desk to see what your annual income is and you meet the minimum requirement. Excellent answer. And he says also when we eventually arrive on the NLV, are we still allowed to come back to the UK for up to 90 days in 180 or do we need to stay, stay in Spain for a certain period? Well, 90 days in 180 isn't part of the equation anymore. That's a Schengen rule. But there, there is, it's all to do with when you're renewing your visa and when you're renewing after the five years to become a permanent resident, yeah. that's that's when it counts, that's when it matters. So take us through the rule there, Chris. Yeah, if you intend to become a permanent resident here, which obviously now after five years, I mean, it's a good idea if you're going to spend all the money to get the NLV and do the renewal to get a permanent residency and this might be most people's uh, desired uh, outcome, uh, then you can't be out of Spain for more than 10 months in those five years, which uh, averages to two months a year. You can do six months at any one time, okay, so, um, you know, so you're not bound, but you can't do more than six months, but you can do up to six months, and um, but that would count into your total. So most people, when they're doing their calculations, just look at their travel plans of being, you know, uh, two months if they have to every year. And if you do less than that, you do earn a little bit in case of an emergency down the line. Mm -hmm. There was a, a court case in some the Superior Court which said, no, you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to. You can still, you'll still get your renewal, even if you've uh, spent over six months in, uh, you know, out of the country. And that, but that was one case. That was a particular case with somebody it wasn't from they I don't think they were from the UK they were from another third country and they had to go back to that country uh, because of a family illness and they couldn't get their way back so and they won that case but it, it seems that because of that news item everybody is saying oh it's okay now they, that's not a rule um, they've changed the law but they haven't changed the law the law hasn't changed on that and the rules haven't changed in the extraordinary is so don't take the risk is the answer to that there we go. Lionel Knight says, we have uh, so many questions on the live chat. Brilliant. Thank you for all of your input today. The the NLV residency uh, year two, three renewal requires immigration approval before making an appointment for fingerprints. What documents do immigration require, require and how long do they take to give a decision? Uh, you, you have to submit uh, proof that you still have sufficient funds for the following three years. We had that there's a very good video I think we did on the on the uh, on the funds and something on it, isn't there? Yeah. Um, and Several. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to prove you've got sufficient funds to support yourself for the two years. You have to prove you've got your healthcare in place, whether that be in a public or private platform. Um, and evidently, you have to submit your application forms, etc., etc., etc. So um, when you do the online uh, submission, which we always say it's best to use the government platform, Mercurio, to do it. You also have to submit proof that if, you're, if a representative is doing it, that you've given them all the right to do so. 
signed application forms. And I think it's always a good idea to submit where you live as well. So if you're on the Padrod, put that in with the initial application, albeit that it should normally just come into play when you register your TIU card. So you shouldn't panic if you haven't got Padrod or you're moving when you make the renewal application. If you've got one, I think it's a good idea to submit at the initial uh, approval, shall we say. Um, in terms of how long is it taking to make a decision? Wow. We've got one in we've got one in Madrid at the moment, which has been five months. Uh, and we've had them in Malaga, which have come through in seven days. The norm at the moment, because I don't know, it's been on the news, there's problems with the Ministry of Justice, people have been on strike, blah de blah de blah. And when you submit a renewal application, you're automatically criminally checked here in Spain using your NIE number. And we believe there's been delays <coughs> for the Australians getting those checks, hence the delays in the renewals coming out. Excellent. I hope that answers your question, Lionel. John McClue's saying, uh, I'm driving over but have made the decision to sell my car to someone from the UK. They'll come over to Spain and take it back to the UK. Oh, cool. are, there, are they covered on their insurance to do that? Uh, so, yeah, if John's coming over, he's bringing it over before he before he registers for his residency and then uh oh, i don't know suppose if you see john's name i suppose they'd have to get the v5 changed over to the person and they'd have to insure it in their name and take it back wouldn't it mm. yeah so, i don't know how british insurance works to be honest i know when it was my father who brought down the car that we've got for six drive mm -hmm. a trip it was like i said i've got this car that i want to do and i've got a drink he went don't worry road trip Oh, but we had yeah. to get V5 put into his name for his insurers, and he got temporary insurance to drive it down here um, off the back of his other insurance from, from the UK. So I'm assuming the person who drives that back would have to do the same. Mm -hmm. There you go. Worth knowing that one, John. Worth reading up. So Paul Cook says, I plan to move to Spain in two years. We'll definitely use up sticks. Yay. Is it yeah. worth me contacting Chris soon to discuss so I can get a timeline and plan together, etc.? Yeah, yeah, book us. But if you go to the, well, unfortunately at the moment, we've got all our, our calls are blocked for October now. Um, so we thought, which is good, but we're conscientious on the amount of calls that we do um, and looking after the clients at the same time. So if you want to book a call for November because you're looking at two years' time, that'd be great because, you know, we have a little chat um, and then you're basically in our system. So then if you do, when you do come on board and you need to book a call again, you won't be waiting on book a call list you just contact jane and she'll fit you in as soon as you're ready to go there you go just a bit of terminology there when chris says your calls are blocked he means that they're blocked in the diary it doesn't mean to say all calls will oh, be blocked. oh sorry no so the diary's <laughs> blocked out well, i mean it was the diary so the diary's full for october so um because we, we what it is we still have to wait for approvals to come through and when the approvals come through so we have a set amount of calls that we do just to make sure that we don't have too much going on and but if more approvals come through, then we might open up a few more calls to continue with more stage ones. But um, at the moment, um, yeah, October. With James on holiday at the moment as well. That's a mm -hmm. very well-deserved holiday, I have to say. So uh, November's the next time we're offering calls. John says it would be nice to see Jane on from Upsticks. She's been watching. YouTube. No, I think I've asked her before and she said no. Categorically no, you. said there's no chance you get you you you, you said you, she said you enjoy it, you get it, and there's no way in a million years that Jane's going on YouTube, I'm afraid. Which is a shame yeah. because she's such a you know, integral part of the of Upsticks. But um, Yeah, absolutely. And she's lovely. Uh, yeah, everybody knows. And. Anthony is saying, agreed 100%, Joe, we followed since the early days. The two most informative people in race Spain always hit the like button and subscribe if not already and spread to uh, uh, F and F, wash hands, wash hands. I think that's uh, Facebook. <laughs> yeah. And Barry says, I believe tow bars are often an issue when taking and registering UK cars into Spain. They're a pain. Mm. Take them off, don't bring them. That's, no, you can't. You can't. No, they're just a pain because any modification on a vehicle is is a pain here in Spain. They don't allow them for registration. So, mm -hmm. if you have a tow bar and it is figures on inside the conformity of the vehicle, i.e., you've got the manufacturer's proof that that relates to the conformity of the vehicle, then you can have it on there. But so often in the UK aftermarket tow bars don't fit into that conformity, and they make you take them off. When the big thing with newer cars is that when they make you take them off before, the, they make you take the whole installation off. 
so that's the electrics everything and if it's welded to a support bar across the back like the many mercedes especially you know the, the newer ones you have to mm. remove that and put a new one in there across the board. what a pain so that's another thing that has um bit one of the big changes that's that's down on my big list i'm gonna i'm just gonna very quickly read any any other bits of, of things that's changed off my list in my notes let's see where did we get up to we were talking about border control getting used to things customs officers getting used to dealing with new rules going in and out of the uk again that's at all of schengen's outer borders including all airports uh, ports uh, and things like that they've there's new paperwork to fill in and there's been a lot of discussion a lot of angry discussion on Facebook about how much people are paying and I know about um, uh, import and export businesses also getting your getting post packages in from the UK to Spain can cost you a fortune I know people have sent presents to their relatives from the UK to Spain or the opposite way and they've had to pay at the other end so you have to pay for getting a present yeah. um, and there's been a lot of uh, rage about that kind of thing so and I, just, I know I companies. Know that. I, had to, I had to pay for. I'm not, I'm not allowed to say it, am I? Do you remember Barry sent, sent us a present for my son once? Yeah. I got a little tickle from me at one of them as well. They came. You can have these, but you've got to pay us this. And I went. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> as it turns out, they were fantastic. But um, but yeah, and we send packages um, to our clients. So let's get started. Packs go out, and they're documents, and we have to make a special special declaration that they are documents and you know each pack even though it's less than a kilo i mean now the price is about 30 euros for each one that goes out mm -hmm. and um the other day i didn't know this um the guys who come to the office to pick it up i mean they're amazing i don't know how they get it to the uk in 24 hours but they do uh, they came to pick it up and we've been doing this for two years with the same company and then one of them just went mad at me and went what earth's in here and i went well it's, it's, it's a pen we give pens to the clients who can't do that he can't he can't i say how long have you been putting pens in him i said two years he went, you can't do that he said that's the product we've got this down as document i'm like ah oh, i didn't tell him about the fridge magnets but I was like, <laughs> well they're flat you can get away with that yeah. <laughs> so unless got, they open everything up out the pen at the bottom and said you can't do it. so now i just hide them but um but yeah so it's it's, it's you know whereas before it's just like i'll oh, check it out now it's you have to fill out a special declaration for each one that goes out that it's documents etc etc mm. so import and export businesses losing business a lot of businesses have gone down and i noticed this from when we were living in ireland as well getting anything from the uk and uh, amazon.ie the irish version is actually it's just amazon uk it's exactly the same company and most things because they don't make things in ireland it's not a manufacturing country everything is is imported from the uk or from europe or it goes through the uk even if it comes from europe that's where the that's where the lorries go and that's then the planes tend to land in london and then come over to dublin and then get sent out from there on the lorries so we've been noticing that it was taking an extra day for things to get through and they were costing more because they were putting their prices up all companies put their prices up suddenly and we had a, a very good friend where we were living in in ireland seamus proper irish name so he was from london used to talk like that my name's seamus <laughs> his uh, um his, his business he was dealing on like a market stall with kind of hippie products you know and, and he and all of the stuff he got through the uk except yeah. the stuff that he you know brought in from india but even then it was a lot of it came through the UK, it came through London. So he, he had an awful trouble. And Liz, my wife, she, she gets a lot of her, her product, her aromatherapy products, from the company that, that she had got her qualifications from, which is one of the top companies in the world. That she can't do that anymore because the prices have gone through the roof. They've had to put in customs charges in with their prices. And you can't guarantee that you're not going to get a charge at the end of the day when you receive them. So um so yeah that's been bad for businesses and bad for customs officers who must be getting a, a face full uh when they're you know of complaints although they're quite good with dealing with complaints they're one of the only agencies in the uk where and, and this is true legally it's uh, customs and excise and the taxman they're the only people who can 
make you guilty until proved innocent. Uh, whereas uh, with every other law, it's innocent until proved guilty. But not with customs, you can't do it. They are even uh, more important than the tax man. Yeah. There you go. And uh, and then uh, also on my list, industries where the rules are still being written, like fisheries. And one of the, the last things before the, the withdrawal agreement finished was the, there were three industries, I can't remember the other two, but but fishing rights became a sticking point and there a lot of the rules and laws are so complex it's going to be 10 years before they're all changed from EU to British law and Rishi Sunak the Prime Minister at the moment this is probably not for much longer uh, uh, kept promising oh we'll we'll get uh, you know a thousand laws changed over to to British in the next I think he said in the first hundred days of his uh, uh, of his um, deal that um, that he'd get it all done and uh, and the lawmakers are saying it's not possible you can't it's just too complex we haven't got the staff in uh, that make the laws to to do that so and uh, and there's there's not enough time they've all got to go up uh, into the house of lords and be approved you know they're all old blokes sleeping most of the time in there anyway so uh, they're not going to do it so there you go. That's uh, anything else. Oh, doctors and health centre staff in the UK and Spain having to deal with medical certificates. It's all been a pain for them. And then there's the driving licence debacle. So all of the uh, the DVLA and the DGT on, you know, on both sides of uh, going through that whole process. The, the British ambassador going through that whole process and his staff. And uh, yeah, so that's that's most of the the things that I've put down as being the big changes. I'd, I'd put down next. It was all about the Irish foreign births register and everything. So there you go. And uh, yeah, that's my list. I think the I mean the biggest I think the biggest biggest change really now for people coming over is the as we've been seeing on the, the live feed is the amount of planning that goes into it and how <clears throat> what is quite refreshing is how conscientious clients are. You know, we're speaking to people, everything from, you know, we, we, we're doing visas now for people who started communicating with us in 2022. You know, so it's um, the the planning that goes into it um, is is incredible now, especially, you know, financial planning. A lot of people are, you know, are, are ring fencing money to get the five-year period, maybe considering working after that even. You know, so um, whereas before residency in Spain was a sell. You had to sell it. You had to tell people, no, no, it's actually a legal requirement. You are supposed to, if you want to be here, albeit you're EU, you still have to go and register. And they'd be like, no, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking yeah. about residency, you know, and you'd be like, well, okay, well, no, it, it, and it'd be, it'd be hard work trying to explain to people, but now it's, it's something that's, um, you know, extremely well planned. And a lot of, we, we would, that this week, I was talking to people who, you know now there's only a certain amount of information we can give them but you can go this is the current structure this is you know, what we need to be looking at you know so well um, mm. there's been so many changes in the last few years even yeah. even you know it's continuous that yeah. you don't know exactly what it's going to be like it's certain rules that you think well yeah there's still going to be non-lucrative visas but you don't know if the process yes, is going so. to be I different so. at all it might all be all be completely online by then it could, it could be. I mean, the, they have a lot of uh, the Mercurial platform they're using for the renewals. They're, they're slowly but surely getting rid of the presidential appointments for third country nationals and renewals um, and people like EU family members and stuff. I know here in Malaga, they're looking at, I think, 2024, they're saying that you won't be able to do it presidential anymore. You have to do it all online, either using your digital certificate or getting someone to do it for you. Mm hmm. There you go. Robo says, I renewed my passport a few months ago and it took nine days. Oh my God, I just realised my microphone is way over there. Can you hear me any better? There we go. Obviously, people are understanding what I'm talking about. Um, Barry says, a friend of mine had the passport problem last week. It cost £193 for a fast track replacement. Yeah, there's an extra charge for that. They had to get a flight four days later. Uh, well, at least it's possible, you know, but yeah, you do have to pay through the nose on that. Robbo says, what's the time scale on getting your, uh, on or when arriving in Spain with a UK car to change plates and get the ITV? That's the MOT for anybody who doesn't know. Um, 
depends what you are, but normally, you know, you can get it down to definitely no less than six weeks. I was saying it depends on your residency as well. Uh, I do a couple of months, but you can get temporary plates, which should last for 60 days to cover you while you're going through the process. Mm -hmm. Great. John McClue says the UK is run by a Marx Brothers government. Yeah, it's not, not Marxist, but Marx Brothers. <laughs> there is a big difference. Yeah, you're quite right. It's comedy. You go to Locha. Did you know that that soup has got a scene that was filmed in Locha in Granada where you stayed? Yeah, it's the opening scene of the film, isn't it? That's got yeah. a, a scene that, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Bev says, Damien, that's your husband, having problems getting Irish passport. Who can be witness? It's quite limited and needs to be, they need to be contactable by a landline. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, because they've got to be checked that way. He started going to church as a priest can witness. That's that's funny. There is, there is quite an extensive list that I saw at the, um, uh, when I was looking at, getting my, you know, when I went to the notary, I think. Uh, but, you know, I mean, doctor's one of them. So, but a lot of doctors won't do it. Because mm. maybe they just don't don't know you. You know, if you've not been to the doctor for six months, they go, well, I don't know who you are from Adam. But I can't see how, how anybody, one of those officials, can't do it. If you go in with your passport, look, it's me on the passport. I'm here, standing in front of you. Can you just sign this piece of paper to say, you know, put your stamp on it and say, yes, I've checked. They were here. They were real. So, uh, yeah, I've got to get, I want to get my passport copied and, and stamped by a notary so that I don't have to carry my passport around anymore because apparently a notarised copy is okay. But although I wouldn't like to be stopped by the, the Guardia Seville with just a piece of paper. A lot of people, yeah, a lot of people, it's like, what are those? You are supposed to carry I mean, the, what would happen if you didn't and they didn't like it, you'd get a present, you'd have to, because you're an EU citizen, you'd have to go down and present it at some point, maybe get a little fine. So, mm. for third country national, very, very different. Yeah. And Alicante says, we have passive income from rentals in the UK, which we will be keeping. Oh, this is in answer to the, uh, the point he was making earlier. Can the equity be... Uh, the equity we own within these properties count towards uh, this is an interesting one this is in the renewal isn't it can the equity we own within the rental properties count towards the 28,000 plus figure we need for the NLV oh this is for your initial application no no so um, your passive rent your passive income from rentals can be used as long as you can prove it um, but the equity in the property won't be used uh, 28k afraid yeah but there's a possibility you can take it into account in certain parts of spain uh, uh, on the renewal uk they've got uk properties so uk properties yeah yeah so in in spain if you own a spanish property then you can put in a notice simply to prove that you own a spanish property and that is an asset that you can use albeit they don't give us a calculation as to how much that actually knocks off the requirements. So, for example, if you've got a house which is worth 28 grand, sorry, let's say 280 grand, when we hand in a note to simply, we don't know if that equates to 28 grand, 10% of the value of the requirements, for example. They just say you can present properties as part of your financial uh, requirement. Um, okay. K properties, you can't. You can only use the rental. There we go. Good, good. It's, not, you said. It's, not, it's an asset which is generating a passive income, but it's not an asset in Spain. So if you have assets in Spain, you can use them, yeah, but not an asset abroad. No. Yeah. Anthony says, sauce so folks, that was a simple emoji clapping hands. Yeah, there's a, they, they seem to come through not as emojis when you when you put emojis in. It just comes through with the with the computer code, which which can be very funny sometimes. And uh, Jed says, with proper planning in my, with forward planning in mind, is it worth getting an NIE before having any firm plans about buying a holiday home or moving moving permanently to Spain? Um, yeah, look, having an NIE number um, is is always a good idea if you think that you might end up having a quick sale or something or quick purchase. You know, so um, I recently did some and uh, for people who didn't have a specific reason. So in theory, you're supposed to have a specific reason to get an NIE number. You have to make, you have to declare that when you go and make the application. Now, the guy in Malaga, he just said, look, if, if it's going to be for multiple reasons and it's for people who don't have a set timeline, which is uh, which is what Jed's talking about, you need to put that he's for opening the bank account. 
So uh, mm. the only thing you do have to be aware of is that the number always stays the same, but when you come to action, that number, you may have to get an updated certificate because in theory, this certificate's only uh, last for three months, albeit the number always stays the same. There you go. And Jed is saying, we have to remember that Brexit hasn't been fully implemented in the UK yet. They are very true. Rules and laws are still being changed. Things will get even worse. That's a nice, optimistic note. <laughs> Bev says, can't be spontaneous now in a lot of things, but you can if you've got one of these. Oh, there we go. I thought I'd bring him back just for a moment. Uh, we're getting, we've passed an hour and a half's worth of the show. So let's zip through the last of the live chat things. So if you've got any questions while we're, while we're chatting away and answering your questions, then uh, quickly put them in now. Thank you for having so much of a chat today. That actually helps the channel. Um, oh, here we go. What's your <laughs> personal opinions from Alicante? Your personal opinions on caravans and holiday homes versus uh, in terms of buying, renting uh, a flat or a house. Yeah, yeah. Which one would you do? Oh, I see. We've seen people on it. I suppose it depends on what you're looking for, really. Funny enough, next week I'll be up in Sado where there's a big uh, uh, caravan thing. Uh, what's the correct terminology? Kind of a fair, is it? Yeah, caravan uh, park there. Oh, and they have a really great community. We've got lots of clients up there, really enjoy being here. But it's a closed community. Um, and there are areas like Malaga, Sado, who have, who, who have a few or four parks. And you know, I know the town hall is very, very well versed for people and give them proper paperwork to register the TIA cards because we've done lots of them and people seem very happy. Uh, renting a flat in a house, you might be slightly more isolated, but then if you don't want to be in that sort of closed community with a lot more um, maybe expat residents or British residents, then the flatter house might be for you. Um, it's uh, So what I would say is discovery trip, discovery trip. You know, it's... Uh, mm. it, I've I've known people who are really, 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 really slightly wary about getting going onto a caravan park, and when they've gone, they absolutely love it. And some people who did thought they were going to love it and have, have left after like three months. So, uh, you know, it's uh, I would rent in flat versus again, it's houses where you go. If you go down to Marbella, a house might cost you three grand a month if you're renting. If you go to the middle of uh, antique area it might cost you 500 so again it depends on the area doesn't it your budget yeah yeah it is it is very personal opinion so i don't know if that's going to influence you in any way but you'll have your own personal needs i suppose uh, i'm not sure what my personal opinion on the caravans and holiday homes i don't think i live in it in a caravan at the moment our needs at the moment are a house with a garden so that's why and we're renting because we're both self-employed and there's no chance of us getting a mortgage at the moment. We haven't got enough money to buy. In fact, we haven't got enough for a deposit at the moment. So not unless things pick up a great deal. Uh, there we go. Glyn says, let's move through these quickly. Simone, my wife said we could never have done this move to Spain without her color coded files. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So I was extremely organized and quick with paperwork. Yes, Paul says, I asked before about an Italian retirement visa. Not your field? No. No, it's not our field. It's a completely different situation. My question to you is, can you apply for a retirement visa if you were in Spain for three months staying on the Schengen rules? Normally visas you have to apply for in the country of residence. I don't know how that applies to Italy, but you do in, in Spain. don't know anything about Italian visas, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yes, so you, you can't, it, certainly for a Spanish visa, you can't apply in Spain. You have to apply to the consulate. Um, there we go, Bev's talking about getting your documents notarised. A lot of doctors and dentists don't do it now. Passport people call to check and they, they only use landline numbers. So that's a bit, it's a bit nasty because there's so many people who haven't got landlines anymore. I don't think my doctor has a uh, yeah, I think they have got a landline actually, but I I always contact them through there. There's a there's a company mobile, and it and it goes through to to my uh, contact there. Um, uh, let's see. Jed, witnesses include a vet for Irish passport. I tried with a passport at a solicitor's, but he said he didn't personally know me. There you go. 
my headphones are running out of charge. There's a little beepy sound going on. Let's go quickly. Spain can change the rules, John says it there. At the drop of a hat, just to confuse us all again. Well, that's bureaucracy for you. And Ant says, signatory Irish 4PP. Initially, our note air failed. Secondly, our family doctor worked fine. FYI, Bev. There we go. And John says I'd pay 8% tax on a property that I purchased in Spain. A chunk of tax. Can we claim any of that back? I um, don't think so. It's a no. purchase tax. Mm. No, I don't think you can. Um, John says, have you considered getting the Irish passport card valid for five years? I did when I applied for my passport consider paying the extra little bit and getting the card as well and i wish i had that maybe when i renew it or something or or i'll i'll wait and get it but yeah that would be easier to carry around and bev says jed that's the problem he's having his first witness was a teacher but they called her during school holidays so damien had to get a new witness oh yeah there we go oh company directors says barry can validate the UK passport. Form an orderly queue, please. Yeah, everybody send your, your notary requests to Barry. <laughs> oh, Barry, you've put your foot in it now. Yeah. Well, brilliant show again, guys, says Alicante. Thank you so much. That's the end of all of the questions. Um, I was going to talk about bits of my experience of, uh, uh, of what Brexit means to me, but uh, I, I think we'll... We'll, we'll bring an end to proceedings. Thank you so much for all of the chat. Um, if you're watching this show back or you didn't have time to put your question in the, in the live chat there, then you can always ask in the comments below after we go off the air. That'll still be here. Make sure you don't do it on some random Facebook expat group because all of the people that watch the video won't have access to it. They won't know where it is. And um, there you go. We're giving folders to let's post some folders out I've had these for ages now anybody want a prize <laughs> yeah don't forget brexit 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 i've got that i've got a stack a stack email yeah. support at upsticks.es or contact scats and we'll get it posted out to you so uh, if, yeah please do watch the whole program back again and uh, just for a laugh even if you're leaving it on in the background that will help uh, and and uh, yeah, and if, if you want to do it so that you can count all of the Brexits, there's another one. So if it's a Brexit's plural, that counts as well. The nearest guess. No, the nearest, what should we say, three guesses? Three sets of prizes? Five. Five. The nearest yeah, five, five guesses. Got five. This encourages what we've got here. We've got a one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so we'll do them in order. We'll do them in order. And there we go. And I'll send a fridge magnet as well, because I've got a load of fridge magnets done. Yeah, you can slide that one in the packet. There we go. Yeah, we sh don't, don't tell them, don't tell them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just suddenly stick to something on the way through passport, on yeah. the way through customs. <laughs> and, uh, there we go. So uh, don't forget to click on the like button if you haven't already. If you have already, then don't click on it again, because it just removes the like. And uh, subscribe as well. And subscribe to the newsletter on the website so that you'll be the first to know. Oh, but not a pen, Bev says. Don't put a pen in there. No, no, definitely not. I'll definitely, I'll, but I'm going to put, that's why I've got the magnets done. So it'll be a folder of magnets. We can post them around the uh, around the world and they won't get pulled. Brilliant. So in a moment, I'll tell you who we have on the show for next week. And uh, But now, we'll, let's just say a huge big thank you with a hug and a kiss to Chris for being wonderful as usual. And we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Cheers, guys. Bye for now. So, on next Saturday's show, who do we have to answer your questions? Well, my potential guest is Luthia the lawyer. That's different from Luthia the financial expert that we had on, was it last week? Yes, I think it was. Um, Luthia the lawyer is arriving back from her holiday. I think she arrived back yesterday, but of course she's not going to be in the office until Monday. So I have to wait until then to confirm. She, it may be that she's too busy dealing with the backlog of emails and and everything that she needs to deal with uh, because of being on holiday. So if she's not free, then there'll be a surprise guest. 
surprise to me as well. I'm sure we'll find somebody who's willing to give you their time. And you can find out through our Facebook page over the next few days when I announce it. And then you can ask questions in advance on there, on the on the U2 Spain Facebook community group or the Facebook page. Or you can subscribe to this YouTube channel and ask questions underneath any of the videos. Thank you to all of you for joining us on the live chat and asking so many questions today. It's been a great show. And thank you to everybody watching the video back afterwards and leaving comments. The video, of course, will be up forever. So you can always go back and look back and scroll back through the through the comments, etc. And of course, hit the like button. Buymeacoffee.com. That QR code is there. It'll always be there. And I will see you on the next helpful video or news item. I'll be, I might be doing lots of little news items. And that's on Wednesday evening, usually when I put that out. And then again, we'll see you live next Saturday morning in our regular time. I'm just looking at John McClue's message. Hand pink waving, hand pink waving, hand pink waving, hand pink waving. Lovely. It's just pink waving hands. Lovely. And um, uh, try that, actually, everybody, uh, this time or next time. Just try and send us some... Uh, oh, the, the laughing emojis are coming through. Some people, are, it's working for them, but, but not for others. Experiment next time, next Saturday show. I'll mention it. Let's see what happens with all the emojis. That'll be a laugh. Well, my headphones have gone off, but I don't need them anymore. That's fine. So see you next Saturday morning, regular time of nine o'clock if you're in the UK or Ireland or 10 o'clock if you're in Spain or Central Europe. That is all for this week. Somebody pass around the Brexit cookies. There you go. I've said Brexit again all the way to the very end. I'm going to say Brexit. Peace and love to all of you. And here's one final message from all of us at U2 Spain on this fine Brexit day. Bye for now. Bye lads. Bye. Goodbye. Toodaloo. Peace and love. Peace and fluff. Oi oi. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. One more cosmic dance? All right then. Look mum, I'm dancing. Oh, I'm all a quiver. Let's dance. <laughs> <laughs>